Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. You can ask gardening questions in the comment section below and uh, that's where I pick from. Make sure you include the zone you live in if it seems relevant uh, to the question that you're asking. Uh, and I pick through each week probably 20 to 26, 27 questions, something like that. And uh, there's always way more than that. So again, thank you guys for your participation. And again, I try to pick some that are relevant uh, to the, uh, you know, whatever's going on. There's a couple of questions about cold weather uh, in here because this next week is supposed to be pretty cold and it's already cold uh, for, very, very cold for a lot of you out in the middle of the country, that's for sure. Holly is right down here and I think you can see her. I think you can see a little bit of her laying here. Uh, it's a, one of her uh, favorite spots out here on the back porch with the breeze blowing today. Our cold air is pushing in, but right now we're not forecast to get um, I think I think we've had a 23 degree night, and I think there's a, just a 23 degree night on the on the. So we're be, I think we're being protected by the mountains just a bit here, uh, on the east side of that. So I hope that continues to be the case. I really don't want anything down. The, unfortunately, some of our plants just aren't actually ready for, you know, temperatures in the single digits. Um, but anyway, okay, all right. Uh, Learn to Garden video series. There's a $25 discount down at the bottom of the video. Thank you to everyone who has bought it over the last year. Uh, there's an upcoming video on shrubs and one on perennials versus annuals uh, for that video series. Uh, this week's videos that went up were one from the uh, from uh, the Ralston Arboretum, a tour of winter interest plants over there, and then one from this garden with winter interest plants and then an unboxing video from Mr. Maple with uh, five plants that uh, uh, I, I think will go well in this garden. Somebody asked below that video, how do you have any more room for plants? Things are, I have to make room for the plants that I uh, got in that particular unboxing video. A lot of the other plants that we've received over the last uh, couple of uh, uh, unboxing videos are actually going for other projects and that kind of thing. Uh, and there's some containers uh, as well. We're just kind of redoing all containers this year. Uh, again, there's some cold questions coming up in this video, and uh, um, I think, I guess we're there. If I sound sick, it's because I am. I was at uh, Mance, uh, Baltimore this week, and uh, it seems like every time I go to a trade show, I come home with something. Just, it, you know, it is what it is, I guess. I, you know, there's so many people that you haven't seen in so long, and uh, and uh, it's kind of amazing. I saw, ran into a lot of people that say they watch the channel, so thank you very, very much for um, saying hello, um, uh, Yulia, who was in the video with uh, other YouTubers that I did back in maybe November, that video went up uh, uh, with them asking, answering questions about themselves. I ran, I ran into Yulia. I didn't get a photo with her. We were on an escalator. Um, she was going opposite directions on an escalator. Uh, and uh, anyway, a lot, a lot of folks and then a lot of industry folks. Uh, Dr. Armitage, if you follow my Instagram at HortTube, there's a photo with Dr. Armitage. Uh, him and I talked talked for a long time. Anyway, uh, great week uh, up at um, up in Baltimore, and uh, that's one other thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump to that question right here. It's actually question number six, but uh, we'll just do them out of order. I have got a ton of a speaking request for uh, this spring. So if you're one of those folks that have reached out with a speaking request. And I haven't responded to it yet. It's just because it's been an overwhelming number of speaking requests, more than there are days <laughs> in the spring. Uh, and so I appreciate everybody asking uh, for um, uh, uh, for me to speak to their groups, uh, horticulture groups, uh, extension agency groups, and all kinds of groups. Uh, I, I do. I'm very flattered, uh, and it is something that I enjoy doing. Uh, but there's only a few that I can do. Uh, each spring and summer. I'm about to create something on my website uh, that will explain more about um, my speaking so that I can just refer people to it. I realize, realizing that I can't, re not responding better, it would be easier to respond with, here are all the answers to your uh, questions about me uh, doing public speaking. And I have some fun things that I do um, at public speaking. I'm not going to give them away uh, on here because I want people to, you know, if you, if you do see me uh, speak live somewhere, um, and I'll let you guys know if there's some place that you can come, you know, that, that, that I'm speaking at. But anyway, thank you so much. Uh, it's very flattering, and uh, I, I do appreciate it. And I enjoy, uh, I enjoy my time meeting folks in those types of events. Okay, let's get to some questions. Uh, so this will be uh, number two. 
Uh, somebody wanted more videos on trees uh, this coming year. There definitely will be more videos on trees. It's something that I've neglected on this channel, something that I'm extremely interested in. I've got plans for videos with Mark uh, Wethington on, uh, on trees at the Ralston. I did a couple of videos on narrow trees and weeping trees uh, back in October. Uh, and there'll be, again, there'll be lots more of those. The unboxing video from Mr. Maple had three Japanese maples in it, uh, ornamental tree, you know, small ornamental trees. And it's something that will be more concentration uh, this year. So somebody wanted me to show my technique for finding cables underground. I don't think I want to do that because I don't want anybody to blame me when they cut their cable line um, or get charged for cutting their cable line. It's super important to get your cables marked when you move into a house. So it's, it, you want to know where the gas line and the electric and the water and you know the ca the cable line are probably not as many people have a telephone you know regular telephone line anymore. But uh, certainly you have those four. Uh, you know, some sort of Wi-Fi cable that's usually the cable line. Uh, but, you know, the, you, you want to know where they are in the garden. But I still, I'm still going to garden, okay? So, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to be demonstrating how I find cables underground. But there were landscape jobs where, I mean, the big, there's a big giant bed going over the cable line. Uh, and, they, you know, they marked the cable line. The, it was right down the middle of it. Uh, so, but I still had to work. So, Again, I talked about in that video last week, just making sure, you know, if the cable, if the cable's running this way, you don't want to be sticking your shovel in this way, right? Because if you, when you find it, it will be because you've cut it. So make sure your shovel is, you know, running horizontal, um, you know, the blade of the shovel is running horizontal to that line so that when you find it, hopefully you're just going to scoop it, uh, scoop back and pull back on it. Again, Jim didn't tell you how to do that, <laughs> but we did have to find them. I mean, physically find them at times. I, I never worried that much about, especially on newer construction, I never really worried about electric or water all that much because having done new construction landscaping, we would be on site landscaping when the electric trench was inspected. So that's something that actually gets inspected on new homes to make sure it runs 36 inches down. Uh, typically, um, I don't know if it's the same in every area, but here in our area, you know, there's that electric line supposed to be way down in the ground, so nobody's putting shovels through it. Um, so I never worried about it as much. But there are other lines that are just very, very shallow, and they're shallow because they don't want to cut the electric line. They don't want to cut the gas line. Uh, that, you know, um, no matter what. And sometimes lines can be mismarked. Maybe one's unmarked. I mean, a lot of reasons. But definitely call, get the lines marked, figure out where they are. But I'm still going to garden. Uh, I, you know, and I got to work my way around that and figure that out. And any shallow lines, like the cable line, I'd like to still still plant around it. But again, be careful how you dig around it because you can find it versus cutting it uh, to to find it. Okay, let's see. Um, so somebody has a strip near their pine trees where their turf uh, doesn't grow well, and they're thinking about uh, quitting the pursuit of grass. Okay, uh, and this is true normally as, as turf gets closer to a wood line. Like if I had turf in this back garden and I was trying to maintain it well, the closer I got to that dry area where the roots are in the back of this property, the worse that grass is going to do or the more inputs I'm going to have to have, more water, the more, you know, the more of everything I'm going to have to do. Heck, the more raking I'm going to have to do. Uh, so there's, you know, it's always, and frequently that turf is going to be thinner. So whether you're using... Um, I don't know if this person's using warm season grass like Bermuda, definitely as Bermuda and centipede and zoysia and um, what am I missing? I said centipede, Bermuda, Good. how did I miss Bermuda? Uh, as those grasses get closer to a wood line, they just don't like shade at all. And so they're always gonna struggle. And then the fescues and uh, bluegrass, um, perennial bluegrass, uh, as those get too close to major roots, uh, they just struggle because they need more water. Uh, and just grasses in general don't like that much shade. They'll take, you know, bluegrass will take a little more shade than others, but for the most part, and you'll see, you know, how thin it is. And if your grass is thin and you can see the ground through your grass, then you're also in all likelihood losing soil every time it rains. You're gonna lose soil to erosion uh, if you can see the ground uh, anywhere, whether it's a mulch bed, whether it's a turf area, whatever it is, if you can see the soil, you're going to be losing soil when it rains. It's going to move, it's going to move about um, in your garden. So it's another reason, you know, 
I talk about keeping the soil covered. Grass is something that covers soil, uh, obviously, and it needs, you know, hopefully mowed up high enough where you aren't having thin spaces. So again, as you get closer to trees, you're likely gonna struggle, struggle with turf. They wanted to know if they could just use the compost and wood chip method uh, that I used here. And I said, yes, absolutely. And can they start now? Yeah, you can definitely put out, it's easier to work definitely when it's cold outside than it, when it's super, super hot outside. So if you can get, you know, you don't have to use compost and wood chips. I did here. Uh, uh, Soil Cube sent me some compost and I was definitely more than happy to use it to put down a layer of basically humus down at the bottom uh, and then that thicker, chunkier material up on top. Well, if you look at a wood, you look at the soil in the woods, that's how the soil looks, right? You have the chunky branches and leaves and, you know, twigs and cones, um, acorns, whatever it is, all the chunky stuff's on top. And then as you dig down through it, everything gets smaller, 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 till you get to a really, a really black, rich, organic layer uh, before you get down to the native soil uh, down below it. And, you know, that's how it's built. So basically, I'm just reconstructing that in a very fast fashion by putting down a layer of compost, which is that, hum that black humus layer, and then putting down those wood chips pretty thick. And it'll just start the action of those wood chips breaking down really quickly uh, and change your soil uh, rather quickly. And then it says, then they wanna know how to handle what's already there. You know, I kind of demonstrated that on this channel here at this house of mowing it uh, to the ground. So again, two different types of grass. <laughs> if this is Bermuda grass and uh, you want to know how to get rid of it, you may end up having to spray it in some way or bury it for a prolonged period of time in order to actually kill it. If it's fescue or bluegrass or one of the uh, cool season grasses, you can probably pretty effectively mow it as short as you can and then bury it in this compost and wood chip method and most of it will be gone. Despite the fact that it's a perennial grass, most of it will be gone. Bermuda, some of it's going to slip through and come up through it uh, and other warm season grasses. So I do, again, I don't know what type of grass they have. Uh, they're in zone 7A in Richmond, so I'm guessing they probably have a cool season grass. Maybe they have a warm season grass, but if it's a cool season grass, it'll be easy to kill by scalping it off and burying it. Uh, so if anything comes through, even if you're making the decision to spray something, you can always say, well, if I go out there and spray it before I do any work, then I have to spray the whole thing, right? I have to spray the whole area. If I scalp it off, covered in compost and wood chips and then see if anything comes up through that, then I only spray what comes up through that. So I'll have reduced the amount of chemi chemicals uh, that I used in the process. So even if you were gonna spray it, I would go with the scalp and berry technique. I guess I said something last week about going to the Ralston Arboretum to find winter interest plants and that would be a good video. I had already shot that video and it went up and I actually have another one with Mark uh, on winter interest plants at the Ralston. And it's not so specific the one that I put up this past week is on very specific plants at the Ralston. Uh, the video with Mark Wethington is more about the things we're looking for that can be winter interest uh, in the garden. It can go way beyond flowers. Uh, so I think that video should be pretty interesting. I hope to have it up. So it'll be up before next Sunday's Q&A. Uh, let's see, I already spoke about speaking request. Uh, okay, so this is a question. Uh, this is the most confusing thing about fertilizer. I know I've talked about this before, but I think it's important as we come up on fertilizer time and maybe somebody's ordering their fertilizer uh, here in January, because it'll be sometime, you know, beginning of March or something when you see me put down fertilizer on this whole garden uh, out here, and it won't be very much. But the question is, is fertilizer for acid-loving shrubs? Is holly tone the best fertilizer for acid-loving shrubs? Uh, so you have... Um, I use, uh, Espoma makes several different things. They make rose tone and flower tone and lots of different tones. But the two that I would normally consider using just as a general fertilizer would either be plant tone, which you'll see me use in this garden, or holly tone. Holly tone has some sulfur in it, uh, which helps lower the pH a bit in the soil for acid loving plants. If you already have acidic soil, you do not need that sulfur additive. It's one of the confusing things, I guess, if, you, if the fertilizer bag says, it, all, the, all of these fertilizer for acid-loving plants, 
they used to all just say azalea camellia rhododendron fertilizer. So it was just this broad group of acid loving plants and they put, they put them in the title because lots of people had azaleas or camellias or rhododendrons. Uh, that, um, th those fertilizers are only necessary if you need to lower your pH some. So the main thing in this question is to get your pH tested. If you have a lot of acid loving plants, which most of us do, uh, especially if you're watching this channel, most everything I'm planting is, uh, there are some alkaline, uh, there are some plants in this garden that will take alkaline soils. Boxwoods are on that list. And I would imagine if I thought about it for a while, there's lots of plants out here that will take more alkaline soils, but the overall group of plants probably prefer a pH somewhere around, you know, five and a half to six and a half, something like that. Uh, as a group with blueberries wanting a really low pH at like four and a half or something crazy like that. Uh, and the, uh, again, as an example, boxwoods probably would prefer somewhere around a neutral seven to 7.5 pH, something like that. You know, so what that pH controls is nutrient uptake. And I got a video on the channel about why pH is so important where you can learn that these different nutrients are available at different pHs. Okay. So if, you need to get your pH tested. I think it's more important than any. It's more important than any other type of soil test that you would do. It's just a basic pH test. If you find out your pH is somewhere between 5.8 and 7, you probably just don't have to think about anything because most every plant's going to grow in that kind of that kind of soil. 6.5 being the optimum of pH for plants. If you're going to have a wide, diverse selection of plants. If you're gonna have a blueberry farm, you would want to drive that pH down toward four and a half or something. But if you were if you were just wanted to grow a wide selection of plants, I would say anywhere between 5.8 and 7, uh, you could probably grow most of the things you wanted uh, to grow. So if your pH falls within that, you don't just don't need to be manipulating it at all. Uh, you know that so that that's the thing. So. You don't need holly tone for acid loving plants or any kind of fertilizer for acid loving plants if your soil is already acidic. That's the answer uh, to that question. I hope that I hope p folks understand that, but get a pH test done. Uh, and if it's in between 5.8 and 7, man, you are just in the sweet spot. Just use plant tone to fertilize or uh, some sort of general organic fertilizer. I really don't care what you use. I don't not on anybody's payroll for fertilizer uh, at all. So, um, use whatever organic fertilizer you want to use. A lot of times, and I might this year use something different out here just because I like to use different things and not keep using the same products over and over and over again. So I may switch to something this year just to, just to switch it up and more just to tell people I'm switching it up because I don't want to add, over add something that might be in one fertilizer or another. Um, but you don't need fertilizer for acid loving plants if your soil is already acidic. Okay. Um, Somebody said, what, what's the most attractive butterfly bush uh, for honeybees, um, butterflies, just whatever. So the, mo the one that um, has the most flowering or attracts the most, uh, uh, they had said they were looking at black knight. Black knight's been around forever. It's a dark purple, very large growing butterfly bush. All the butterfly bushes will get cut down. I'm, what time is it right now? What is it? Middle, it's mid-January as you're seeing this almost. Uh... My birthday is Monday. I just realized I made it all the way to the 13th of January filming this and just I haven't even thought once my birthday is uh, the day after this. Um, the sometime mid to late February, I'll cut all the butterfly bushes uh, back, I'd rather they're dwarfs or big ones. I, I don't think it really matters which one uh, butterfly bush you get. If, if you have a butterfly bush, you're going to get uh, butterflies and you're going to get bees if they're in your area for sure. Uh, I will tell you um, some of the larger growing old ones like Black Knight are very good uh, at luring butterflies uh, into your garden. Uh, no question about it. I will tell you though, this is kind of funny because this is an experiment, an accidental experiment that I had. I grew, uh, I grew a ton of butterfly bushes at my nursery and if you looked, so if you had purple and blue and white and lavenders and whatever other colors of butterfly bushes you could have yellow yellows were genetically inferior but we grew yellow butterfly bushes you grow them all together so you got this big giant block of butterfly bushes in a nursery and then you look at where the bees are and you look at where the butterflies are they were almost always on a blue variety they chose blue uh, and i think it 
it's in, in most of the seedling butterfly bushes I see come up, if you're, uh, butterfly bushes can be invasive in places. Most of the seedling ones I see come up are some shade of blue. Uh, so I believe that there's something about in Budlia Davidi, uh, that blue coloration is the color that uh, m for some reason most attracts them. But again, if I have a pink butterfly bush out here, I'm going to see plenty of action on it. But if I put a, all I'm saying is if you put a pink one and a blue one next to one another, all of a sudden, or blue to purple in that spectrum, all of a sudden you see more on that color. Uh, it was always interesting to me, just, you know, observing in a nursery setting, which they would choose if they had all the choices. Okay. Somebody has fewer blooms on their Camellia Sasanqua this year. Uh, they wanted to know if it was probably too dry this year leading up to them blooming, or was it cold from last December? So, I mean, obviously, you know, the cold from last December, if you had a very small uh, camellia and it got, you know, you lost a third of it, it probably would have set it back some blooming this year. But if it was barely damaged by that cold last winter and then it did some significant growing this year, you probably still should have had a good amount of flowers. And I would think it was probably... It was dry at the wrong time this year. So we were dry from midsummer right up through mid to late fall. And man, now we're flooding. But we were dry in that spot where it was forming those flower buds, swelling those flower buds and opening those flowers. So in all likelihood, it was too dry. Uh, but again, you could have had definitely that, that winter freeze last year, you know, was significant. And I have a Camellia japonica in the front garden out here that I would definitely say is still stunted. Uh, from that cold. Uh, it only has three or four flower buds on it, which is about the same as it had last year. It should have grown quite a bit this year, but it definitely struggled coming back from that. But again, so it's really that. Did you see it grow a whole lot from that freeze? If you did, then it was probably dry. If you didn't, then it was probably from that freeze. Okay, so somebody asked about advice for zone pushers, uh, folks that are growing. Uh, they, they had a Bracken's Brown Beauty uh, magnolia that they were trying to grow further up north, which is our evergreen southern magnolia. Uh, they were trying to grow the April series camellias, which are zone 6 camellias, uh, probably 6B reliably, 6A, you know, with protection, uh, camellias. Uh, I just want to know overall zone, uh, uh, overall advice for zone pushers. For number one, I have a cover for that plant. If there's something in this garden that's only zone 9 or 8B hardy, uh, there's a cover for it somewhere. In fact, there's a chair behind the camera right now that's got a pile of blankets on it prepared for this week. I've got a giant shade cloth I keep in my pickup truck that I use for covering when I... It's been in my, literally in the back of my pickup truck for 22 years, uh, but I bring it out into the garden. It's giant, um, and I can cover large swaths of things with it. I have all kinds of shade protect... all kinds of protection materials uh, to use for the things that I'm pushing the zones on. Um, so make sure if you're putting something in the ground and then of course wind has a significant impact on how hardy something is so if it's very if it's super super windy out in the space you're putting it and it's you know a zone less hardy than your area you know that's probably problematic of course this is all about the temperature that that thing's killed at all right so if it's if it's a plant that's only hardy to zone nine that means it probably doesn't ever want a temperature uh, below, let's say, 30 degrees, right? It can take a small freeze, zone 9A for sure, but it's not going to take, you know, something that's 15. Uh, so really you're looking at the temperatures and you're basing it on my zone 8 stuff probably doesn't want to go below 20. My zone 9 stuff probably doesn't want to go below 30. My zone 7 stuff really, you know, 7B stuff doesn't want to go below 10 all that much. And so before I'm thinking about protecting them, those temperatures are probably off a bit in my, you know, maybe 5 degrees uh, just because I'm throwing that out there really quickly, but you can see what I'm saying. You know, you know how, how cold hardy is that plant actually? Of course, and then, and then again, wind is going to have an impact on that. Uh, having it out in open space and having the wind blow across it uh, could cause more damage to it, especially if your ground freezes. We're lucky here. We're not in a place normally, um, she's looking up here, uh, normally where our ground freezes solid. And without the ground, you know, so the wind is not as significant. If the ground freezes solid and then the wind comes across it, uh, then the plant can't bring up any water to protect itself. So most of my zone pushing things are up against the foundation out of the wind, uh, and uh, I have a cover for them. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good technique. The main thing 
Also, the, uh, the other biggest thing is make sure you're spring planting so that everything has a whole season uh, underneath its belt. I'm pretty well convinced that there are probably a good amount of plants that if we were really fine-tuning where they're hardy, we could probably say something, uh, it's hardy in zone 7 to 9, but a 3-year-old established plant is hardy in zone 6 to 9. There's probably a lot of plants like that. Uh, that if it had three years where it didn't have a zone six winter, uh, it would have no problem against in a zone six winter, you know, in a temperature that was below zero, at or below zero, once it was established and had grown for a while. So keep that in mind. You want to try to get them at least a few years in before you expose them to the severe colds that would be cold enough to damage them. So there's that as well. I would be, I'm amazed anytime we get significant cold, one of the first things I do is I go, go look around at the things that got damaged and I frequently will see that zone, things that were zone pushed that are 10 years old are, you know, not damaged uh, versus things that are, you know, got went in the, went in the ground in October, <laughs> right before the freeze. So spring plant. Okay. So somebody said, um, what makes trees grow vertically? They have a sweet bay magnolia and all parts of it are growing very fastidious. I see a lot of sweet bay magnolias like that. Uh, they're, you know, they're woodland natives to the southeast here, and uh, they uh, they tend to, you know, when I see them, they're racing for light, uh, you know, up in the to the canopy. So I tend to see them kind of narrow and tall. Although there's one at NC State that'll be in a video that I did, uh, the little tour video over around NC State's campus. It's kind of a wider. Uh, one, but it's been there forever and ever. But most of the time I do see them pretty fastidious, you know, up, upright and narrow. Uh, but if you're asking what makes a tree grow vertically, a lot of times it's because it was grown really close together at the nursery. Uh, a lot of our trees are grown by racing one another. Um, and it's why I really feel like it's a, like a lot of, several of the trees I have in this garden are not able to support themselves very well because they were basically grown in a race uh, against other plants and so they were grown basically each of them shading each you know each other and it forced them to grow chasing the light which didn't allow the wood to become you know uh, you know if you if you grow a pine tree people are you know frequently scared of pine trees in big storms if you grow a pine tree in the middle of your front yard and there's nothing else around it and it grows there for 25 or 30 years there's not a tank that can knock one of those things down but if you grow them in a wooded space where they're close together and they raced one another for a long time. And then you go through and you clear out three quarters of them. The ones that are still remaining, first big storm you get, they snap and break, uh, break off. And you think, so you think pine trees are really bad that way, but it's, a lot of it has to do with the fa how that wood, um, you know, how it held up, against, how, if it had to hold up against wind on its own uh, while it was growing. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of trees just grown too fast, too close together, and I'll see them at nurseries and, you know, re I mean, really, really close together in spaces, tr you know, trying to get growth on them uh, that way, and uh, so that may be that as well. But I do tend to see sweet bag magnolias kind of upright and narrow. I'm thinking this video is going to end up long. Um, my camera has a 30-minute recording time. Uh, and uh, for me to restart it, and it just went off. So I'm thinking, uh, and I'm only on number 12. Uh, I may cut this down a few and uh, do another one later in the week because, again, I'm, uh, I am a, a little under the weather here. Uh, let's see. So somebody said, what is the best time to visit JCRA, the um, J.C. Ralston Arboretum, and Juniper Level Botanic Garden? They had three chances this year uh, to be in the area. I wanted to know when which one they should use to visit the two gardens. Uh, you know, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum is amazing over here, and it's really, it's not, gar it's not you know, it's not a refined garden with a lot of flower flowers and, you know, rows of boxwoods and, you know, those kinds of things. It's just not that kind of garden. It's a collection of plants. Uh, J.C. Ralston was one of the most passionate people in horticulture. I rarely can have a conversation with anyone, a deep conversation about horticulture where J.C.'s name doesn't come up. He shared plants far and wide around the globe, very famous uh, for that. And Tony Avent, who was a student of his, has Juniper Level Botanic Garden and Plant Delights Nursery. Uh, you know, he has 30 some thousand in that garden. And so it's an incredible, between the two gardens, it's a lot of different plants and honestly humbling. 
uh, if you think you know a lot about horticulture uh, or you think you know a lot of different kinds of plants, those two gardens together can be quite humbling um, in, that, in that regard. Uh, but if I was going to be visiting both of them, they said they could come in late February uh, or you know mid-March or mid to late September. I, I would probably wouldn't go in February just because I don't know, like this cold we're getting here in mid-January may shut a lot of things down. So certainly mid-March um, would be good and mid to late September you couldn't lose. So I would say any time between you know, March 15th and November, you would find something uh, interesting at both those gardens any, any time in that span, um, you know, even through, even through the heat of the summer, uh, you, you would find uh, interesting things uh, at both of those gardens. And I highly, you know, recommend, you know, visiting both if you get a chance to. Again, not our super refined garden. Duke Gardens over in Durham should be on your list as well. So um, that uh, uh, near the Duke campus in Durham, uh, is, a, is, is also a, a fantastic garden, a little more refined, you know, overall is, you know, what so, some people will only consider a garden someplace where they can lay in the grass and have a picnic and <laughs> enjoy the flowers. And that's perfectly fine. If that's your, uh, that, that, you know, for me, I'm a, just a hort nerd. And so, you know, as a hort nerd, I want to go see lots of different kinds of plants. So those two gardens, they don't compete at all in my mind. They're, they're both, they both have a role um, out there. One is a kind of a conservation area for lots of different species to evaluate uh, and the other is a place to spend a day having a picnic and enjoying you know beautiful flowering things you know that are arranged in some sort of formal manner. They both are fantastic. You can get both of those here in the Raleigh-Durham area. Let's see. Somebody said about integ integrating vegetables into the landscape. So I've talked about this before. The only reason I don't have my vegetables planted through the whole garden is because my vegetable garden back over my shoulder here is the only thing that's in the full sun during um, these two. Next question kind of goes with this one is the only set, only place where it's sunny all summer long, you know, sun up to sun down. So as I'm um, standing out in this in this garden, if I'm in the front yard in the front garden, that's where the sun comes up. So on this garden, and it actually sets behind the screen porch over these trees behind me. That's the west. So I have tons of morning sun across this garden, and I have tons of sun until about two. That oak tree starts to take over the back garden, and it slides the shadow across the whole place uh, until about four, uh, and the whole garden's in the shade pretty much by four o'clock. Uh, because this back wood line, everything is so tall, and this is such a small lot. As I'm standing with my back to that Laura Petalum, which I frequently do, the large Laura Petalum over here, that's the south side of the property, and that's the direction I'm facing right now. The sun is trying to shine into the, because uh, it's on a low horizon right now, shine into my screen porch on me. And then this side back here is actually the north side, uh, but the sun moves north of us during the summertime, and then it puts that whole area in the sun during the summer. So that's where I grow my tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and all those things during the summer. It's the only place that's sunny all summer long. Everything else has got some shade on it, but I would integrate them into the, into the space. The other issue I have is rabbits. Rabbits are just, they're awful in this garden. And uh, so having them collected together over there, I'm able to keep a rabbit protection fence around my vegetables and keep them from uh, doing a lot of damage to them. So those two things combined. But if I could, my vegetables would just be throughout the garden. They're, they're, you know, they're plants just like any other. My annual plants though, I do treat the soil a little bit differently. So if I'm planting, if you go back and watch the pansy planting video, videos I did a, a month or so ago, when we got back from the trip, uh, if you look at any of the annual, annual flowering plant videos that I've ever done, I'm always mixing some compost in, I'm always improving the soil in some way. And so if you're thinking about your Peppers and tomatoes are actually perennial plants, but for most of us growing them in our gardens, they're annuals. They, they grow all season. First frost, they die, or if it gets too hot during the summer, they die, whatever. Uh, most of all those things, we're growing them as annuals, one-year plants, uh, whether they're perennial or not. Uh, you're trying to get as much out of them as you possibly can, so if I just go out here and I put them in some random soil over here, they're not going to probably be as vigorous and productive as they would be if I made some improvement to that space. So if I, if I were going to integrate my vegetables into the rest of my garden, I'd probably take each of those spaces where I was gonna put a tomato plant or a pepper plant or cucumber or whatever it was and 
you know, pull the mulch back and prove that soil some with some compost. Pine bark soil conditioner, if you can find it, really break that soil up and make sure that that seasonal plant has is can really get off to a good start and give you plenty of opportunity to produce uh, fruit or vegetable, whatever uh, during the uh, during the growing season. So I would if I could, I would integrate them. But even integrating them, I would want the soil improved as I do my vegetable garden all the time. Okay, and I pointed out the north, south, east, west. That was number 14. I think I'm gonna answer a couple of more in this video, and then I'm, it's gonna give me about nine, and I think I'll go back and pull some more up from last week's video. Again, thank you guys so much for participating uh, in these. Make sure you, have, you know, ask gardening questions down below this video for next week. I think there'll be another Q&A up uh, during this week because I think I'm at about 37, 38 minutes, which is probably about as much energy as I have to, uh, to edit and get this video up uh, as you're watching it. Somebody wanted to know um, if should I uh, cut the end of this shovel off, the new shovel that I've shown that, you know, somebody pointed out, somebody finally found the shovel uh, that I've been using, you guys have seen me use, and you can see how much shorter uh, this one is overall where it's worn down somebody wanted to know if i should get somebody to cut this off which i could cut it off i have you know grinding tool that i could cut it off straight actually what i don't like about the tip on the shovel is that it has a tip you see how it's got a pointy uh a pointed tip on it right here you see that that is that's my actual problem with the shovel is that when i go when you're cut when you're digging and you hit roots uh, it actually just slips off to the side and it's very difficult to cut the root. It'll cut the root, but you just have to keep stabbing at it. What happens on one of these shovels as you use them over a long time, they actually develop a little bit of a V in the middle. Rather than a point like that, it has a V and that little part right there will just slice a root super, super easy. So if I was ever going to modify this shovel, I would actually modify it to cut back a little bit so that when I'm digging, I can get, I can cut roots easier because I, you know, if you're digging, if you're planting plants, you're hit, gonna be digging in roots. Of course, you're gonna be digging in uh, gravel and stuff too, and rock, rock and that kind of thing for some of you. I'm lucky I don't have a whole lot of that, but I do have very tough clay soils and I do have lots of root competition out here, but that's actually my issue. I wouldn't probably cut it off flat. I would probably cut it back a bit so that I have that little pocket that this one has uh, to cut a root. Eventually I'll wear it down uh, to that regardless, but I thought that, that was, uh, I wanted to point that out. That my old shovel is great for not only digging, but also cutting roots as I find them uh, and without them slipping off, you know, the shovel slipping left or right uh, like that. Okay, uh, last question for this week. Somebody's in Columbia, South Carolina. Their perennial beds are ugly after the summer uh, they wanted suggestions uh, for plants uh, in an, a perennial bed. So they got perennial flowering things, but cone, you know, who knows, cone flowers, black-eyed Susans, Joe pie weed, whatever the heck it is, lots of asters, I'm sure. Uh, and then, uh, you know, maybe, maybe ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses can be beautiful in the wintertime, uh, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes not. <laughs> sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Uh, uh, depending on which, which which one it is and so it looks it just looks like a weedy mess in the winter time and you'll you know if you have all perennials uh, that are all go dormant and none of them stay evergreen that can happen uh, depending on where you are in the country you know may be you know depend on what you can or can't do here there are some perennials herbaceous type plants that don't go dormant during the winter time you know that I could blend in uh, of course, I, I'm a big fan of you. I'm a big fan of using conifers in the garden because they're, you know, this time of year, all the conifers that have been planted in this garden over the last couple of years are really standouts uh, in the garden. I do like, uh, you know, for me, from a design perspective, I'm not a big, this is my perennial border and this is my this and this is my this. Uh, I'm more of a... I had a spot over there for it and it stays evergreen and the other things around it will go to sleep. So it's going to give me some winter interest. So I blend things a little more uh, throughout the garden rather than having a whole section of anything. Because if I have a whole section of something, let's say I had an azalea garden, you know, when the azaleas were blooming, great. But then the rest of the time, you know, what would it be? Uh, so I would rather have my azaleas planted 
here and there throughout the entire garden and then have other things with them like conifers or perennials or whatever doesn't matter i'm just you know saying that from a for me from a you know from a design perspective i want to look any angle out here and see something that's still evergreen uh, but there's a ton of stuff asleep out there a ton of stuff asleep but when it goes to sleep uh, i still have it you know every angle is still going to have something that's up and uh, evergreen the other thing i would say about south carolina is going to uh, historic i mean about columbia south carolina is going to historic columbia we were down there last was it last year gosh it may have been two summers ago now that we were at historic columbia and i can't i can't remember uh, but that's definitely a, a, a place worth visiting. The one garden over there at Historic Columbia has so many interesting plants that you can grow in that area. And again, everybody, as you're watching, as for some reason that's been the theme of this uh, particular video about visiting the Ralston or plant delights or visiting things. Um, and I tend to do that. I tend to lock in on that this time of year because I think it's really uh, an interesting time of year to visit gardens because there are things you don't know about uh, that could look good in your garden and so i would visit historic columbia and i'm sure there's other gardens uh, in the state that would also um, give you some inspiration to have your herbaceous perennial garden still look a little bit alive uh, during the winter time so thank you guys very much for participating in the q a video and i really do i really do appreciate it i've got several videos are already shot for this week and i'm going to do a second q a sometime in the middle of the week see you soon